Thank you very much uh, for joining us again this Friday uh, for part of our Represent series for LGBT History Month. Uh, today we're talking to uh, Melissa Lee and Matthew Kuhn uh, about um, uh, Asian LGBTQ representation in, mus in um, theatre, musical theatre, performing arts in general. Um, and thank you both so much for joining us today. Uh, it's really lovely to have you with us. Uh, so I think uh, just to get us started off, I'll just get you to say a little bit about yourselves, what your background is, what sort of things you do. Um, so uh, should we start with you, Melissa? Is that all right? Sure. Um, I Hi, I'm so excited to be here and to chat. Um, and so nice to, to meet you as well, Matthew. Um, I, my name is Melissa. I uh, My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I am a musical, well, I'm a writer right now, uh more so on the musical theater side um and i'm also a composer a songwriter and performer um i um i split my time in montreal where you can see it's snowing <laughs> right now and also new york city um and i normally write with my writing partner kit yan um who unfortunately cannot be here today but um sends his love and he wishes he could be here um so yeah, that's that's a little bit about my background. I I do book lyrics and music, and uh, yeah, excited to be here. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, Matthew, over to you. Yeah, sure. Hi, guys. I'm Matthew. Pronouns he him. I'm a dancer, actor, and writer. Um, I have a background in musical theatre and classical ballet. I um, worked with the Northern Ballet based in Leeds. Um, I worked with them. I was a first soloist for eight and a half years, and recently retired at the age of 28. Um, now into the world of freelancing where I'm acting, dancing, writing, doing everything. Um, yeah, that's me. Thank you very much. That's great. So um, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about uh, some of the uh, work that you're working on at the moment. So Melissa, perhaps we could talk a little bit about Interstate, which is the most fabulous mu musical in the entire world that I love very, very much. Um, but it's just about to go on to a, uh, a, a set a, a season I don't know what do we call it a season a production, run, actually, yeah a production at the East West Theatre in Los Angeles so yeah do, do you want to tell us a little bit about that yeah um so Interstate is a musical that is uh semi-autobiographical it's me and my writing partner Kit um and I, in order to talk about the show, I feel like we have to talk a little bit about uh, 2008, which was when he and I went on the road together. We, you know, we met in Boston, Massachusetts, and um, I'm a singer songwriter and he's a slam poet. And we just decided to go on the road together um, as a duo. Um, our band was called uh, Good Asian Drivers. And, and the point was to go around to small pockets of the country and like meet other folks like us um, and to just sort of spread our music and activism. And so, you know, we had this wide eyed dream of doing that in 2008. A lot of dramatic things happened <laughs> in which a lot of feelings were had and then um and then we hated each other and decided not to talk to each other again so fast forward to 2012 we became friends again and we decided you know i i think i think we're going to turn this into a musical i don't know i don't know why <laughs> we decided that because thus began a 10-year journey at this current moment um on writing this musical interstate which is loosely based on us so um, it just follows a trans spoken word artist and a lesbian singer songwriter, both Asian, as they go across the country on a tour and how their music um, touches and affects the life of a young trans South Asian kid from Kentucky. Um, and so it's it's a parallel journey of two trans masculine people at different stages of their lives trying to find uh, meaning and understand love and friendship and community. So, it's, it's yeah. Yeah, it's such a it's such a beautiful story as well. I mean, I think for me that that relationship that's between um, uh, the two characters, the the two trans masculine characters, is is so beautiful. Oh my goodness, why have I forgotten the name of the younger one? I remember the name of Dash. Henry. Henry, of course. Dash, yeah. 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 Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how that kind of relationship grew as you wrote? Yeah. So. Um, so yeah, I guess maybe. To talk a little bit about production history too, you mentioned right now we're about to have a, a production 
at East West Players in Los Angeles. So we're really excited about that because it's really the first time that we're going to put the show up um, in front of like such a large population of Asian folks and queer folks. Like it's like really like Los Angeles is really the hub of like or the intersections of our communities. So we're really excited to see how it does there. Um, but yeah, so we've been working on this since 2012. I think at first we didn't really know what we were doing. This was the first time Kit and I had worked together on a musical. I had done musical theater before. I had written one other musical in Boston. Um, and so we were really learning ourselves as writers and learning how to craft this story. And um, at first it was really just about us. It was the two of us. We played ourselves in a reading in New York. Um, and then eventually we added on like the the noises, the internet, the, the other folks that were, um, that, that while we were on the road, the, we, we felt the pressure of representation a lot. And so we wanted to tell that story of like, what happens when your interpersonal relationship is imploding, but yet you're the only queer Asian trans people at the time that were doing uh, what we were doing, right? So then there were other people that were writing to us saying, oh, you mean so much to us, blah, blah, blah. And, and so we had to keep going while our personal lives were imploding. So we wanted to tell that story. And out of that emerged, you know, a bunch of noises. And one of them that really stuck out to me was this character of Henry, this this kid who's just um, a little bit lost and doesn't have doesn't have um, the support and the community in his small town and um, and what this band really meant to him. So that sort of stuck out and we really developed his character as a parallel journey to Dash's and, and that was how it sort of transformed over the years. And it's amazing how um, some of the songs from Interstate, I feel like I've already broken out of the musical already even before we have that, um, that you know, that, that this kind of, uh, it's not a premiere because it's been run before, hasn't it, but this, this production. And yeah. I, I always think I Don't Look is one of the songs that stands out there um, and as well as um, Lose the Dumplings. And, and I feel like both of those songs are so, they're so specific. And, and I wondered if you could tell us something about that, that kind of idea about how you come up with those, how those really specific ideas, which I can feel like, you know, link specifically into queer identities and Asian identities as well. How does, how does that happen when you're writing? Yeah, um, so for something like I Don't Look, I think we... I'm trying to think this was a while since I've written this. Um, um, I, I think I was trying to understand the point of view of a young uh, Asian kid in a town where he didn't see a lot of folks like him and what and how um, and how the Internet is really a place both to to find connection and also to be feared and, and really how to straddle that right and so i think when i was writing i don't look i really wanted to explore well three things in it three things he's he's singing about um for those who don't know the song you know he's singing about a crush that he has in uh, on a girl in school and he's also singing and as he's typing to the end he's doing a blog on the internet about it and he's talking about not looking at the comments because he's being afraid of trolls so so um so there's there's actually three things so he talks about I, I don't look at this girl in school because i'm afraid of what she might see of me and what she might think of me you know she thinks so she she sees me as you know a as my birth gender as a gender i was assigned right and and not who i really am so that's one and then two is i don't want to look at the tr the trolls online because i'm putting my heart out there and i'm i'm afraid of what comes back and then the third one is uh is that i i don't look like anyone else in school so there's there's like all these white kids that i don't um, necessarily feel like sees me in a way so so yeah, so I think it started from there, and um, and that was the song that ended up coming coming out. Um, yeah, is that's it's, it's. I just find it so. I mean, it's one of my, my favorite things about your work, and actually about Matthew's work that I saw last week as well, is how um, how personal it is and how specific it is. But that, and I always remember. I can't remember who said this to me. Somebody when I was researching the book said the more specific you are the more universal it becomes the more people understand it um the other thing that really interested me and i guess this kind of links a little bit into um into matthew's work as well but the uh, putting henry as a uh, as an asian character into an all-white community but putting them into a community well putting him into a community with um which was a christian community as well and i found i thought that was quite a 
uh, an interesting choice and and somebody as somebody who grew up in a Christian household myself something that really kind of uh, stuck with me uh, as well how did that kind of choice come about um I'm actually not sure how it came about but I will say that what was important to us is that we didn't demonize um his faith I think I think it was important to us that it wasn't like oh here are all these christians who like don't who's not letting him be who he is i think that that is true to some extent but i don't i didn't want him to turn his back on Mm -hmm. faith so so i know james you i think you i don't know if you had read the whole script or if you had i don't think you've seen a production but but you know there's 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 a part i mean i'm i don't think i'm spoiling too much but i feel like you know there's he 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 leaves home to try to see the band i mean that's that's part of the premise of the show and um and he never really turns his back on on christianity i think he finds he finds himself and he finds his strength through that so it was really important for us to rep- represent that um community of queer people who don't who don't feel that way who still feel connected to god um yeah that was yeah. important to us yeah it's it is it's such a it's such a lovely musical and uh, there's so, there's so much to it as well i mean i was lucky enough i did see i think i've seen a, an earlier draft of the script um, I think I saw that probably two or three years ago when I f- was first talking to you about it. Um, and I, I'm, I mean, you know, Los Angeles is quite a long way from Birmingham, but I really hope <laughs> that I'm able to find some way to come and see uh, the production because I love it so much. It's just one of it's one of my favorite musicals in development at the moment. So, oh, um, thank you. I'd love for you to great. see it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, keep fingers crossed. Yeah. See what we can do. Um, so yeah, so Matthew, you're at quite a different um, stage of your writing career, but uh, I wonder—I don't know um, really if, if you'd prefer to talk about um, your writing or whether you'd prefer to talk about your your dancing, or we can talk about them both at, at some stage. But uh, do you want to talk to us a little bit about some of the projects that you've been involved recently? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I'll, I'll talk about the writing. It's very—I'm very, very early stages, and actually, hearing you talk about your work, Melissa, is. Like I also want to come to LA to watch it because it sounds incredible. Um, I so recently, very recently kind of ventured into writing. Um, so my background is um, I started out acting in musical theatre um, and kind of like from a very young age, starting there, I moved into ballet and ballet being all encompassing and very disciplined art form, I dedicated my life to it. And I worked for many years as a ballet dancer um, but throughout those years, I knew that I wanted to come back to acting and come back to, you know, finding my voice uh, eventually. And I did the whole, you know, classic pandemic made me rethink my life. And I resigned and I essentially jumped into the world of acting and writing, um, supported by a lot of um, amazing people in the UK, the East Asian theatre and acting um, scene. There's um an amazing company called New Earth Theatre who um, support vo- new voices, particularly East and South Southeast Asian voices. And they really offered me a couple of opportunities to write. And I started out with spoken word and poetry. And then they kind of said to me, look, we want to nurture you and we want to see what else you can do. And we have a scratch night on at the Lowry in Manchester and you have free reign to write about anything that you want to write about. and so I wrote about myself so it's quite similar to the musical that Melissa's talking about it's very autobiographical um, inspired by my life um, and particularly this moment right now where I'm transitioning from kind of a world where everything was known and I had a full-time job I was I knew the world I was in and then kind of jumping ship um, into the unknown Um, it was inspired by something called the great resignation, which is supposedly happening right now, which is lots of millennials and young young people quitting their full-time jobs after the pan- pandemic, because they've kind of had a moment to reevaluate what they really want to do and doing it, or, you know, just quitting and going into unemployment and being happier. So it was really inspired by that, but it also pulled on my kind of, my upbringing, which um, I also grew up in a very tight-knit Christian community, community a Chinese community. Um, so the piece that James saw the other week was called Existential, and um, it was just a small collection of monologues and a two-hander that I wrote. Um, and yeah, it really pulls. It just really very very sounds very similar to Melissa's. I I really resonate with that. Um, I felt that 
I had to write what I needed to see on 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 stage on screen. Um, and in the UK, we there aren't very many East Asian voices, let alone East Asian queer voices. So I just I thought to myself, what 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 would I want to see on stage, and what would I want to hear? And so I wrote what I needed, and it, yeah, what you said, James, when you write about your truth, it somehow res resonates mm -hmm. with many people and I'm glad that it did um and yeah I've so I've written I've performed it once and hopefully it can go from things will go from here and we'll see yeah and I, I found it really interesting that you based the story or the the concept was based quite closely around the prodigal son um mm. which feels I guess is such an important story in the Christian faith but also is I just find it such an amazing story because you can read it from so many angles and you can you can think about it in so many different ways. Um, yeah. And it's a, it's a story I think I've used before when I many, many years ago, when I used to work with Scripture Union, I used to um, devise uh, plays or retellings of stories for young people. And The Prodigal mm -hmm. Son was one of my favourites to redo because it's just the characters in it are so good or you can yes. put characters in it that are so good. Um, yeah. But um it's yeah I find it so in terms of the work you're developing where do you see it going where, where do you see it going next now that you've got this kind of really exciting starting point mm. um well you know there's all I mean I have many ideas <laughs> the reality of it is another story um like I said I'm really lucky to be kind of being nurtured and supported by amazing um organizations who want to uplift but these specific voices um I always say, I mean it's very hard to imagine you can be something when you can't see it and you can't see other people doing it um so yeah I I've I've many plans um just touching back on the piece that I wrote um the prodigal son story um yeah it was just it was it is a story that I've heard a lot growing up um particularly from the church the church story and but um the way that i wrote it was kind of from the perspective of the prodigal son um who who is you know very lucky to come back home and to be welcomed back with open arms and i think i wanted to kind of i i resonate with the prodigal son but there's also parts of me who think what if what if what what does the prodigal son really think like is he coming back out of desperation is he happy is he actually happy to the, to be back there must be an element of embarrassment for him to come back and i think um that's what i wanted to tap into with that piece um and um yeah having this got gone in some feedback from it um i do think yeah the prodigal son has seemed to touch has seemed to like struck a chord with quite a few people so if i were to develop i'd probably center it around that perspective um of the sun um that's yeah that's really all I could say <laughs> no it's I mean it is it's one of the things that I always uh, I, I've mentioned this a few times during this this series that we've done but one of the things that I always find difficult when we're talking about representation is that people think okay so here's a piece of theatre that's by um, a Chinese person a Chinese queer person so therefore that piece of theatre must only be for Chinese queer people and actually, one of my favorite things is um, is sitting here because I, I sometimes think to myself, well, we're doing a, a panel on Asian um, LGBTQ people. It probably would be better for it to be an Asian, L Asian LGBTQ person to be actually be sat here and chairing the panel. But then from the other side of it as well, I'm just it, the, the biggest thing I've learned is that not to keep yourself in your own box when you're trying to find stories to see your representation, because Matthew, your piece, mm -hmm. you know, it, it touched me so much and. And there were so many similarities in our upbringing. And, uh, mm. and, and of course, they, they, I won't get the full picture of it, but there are certain things there. It's again, this thing about universality. And mm. that makes me always think, why is it that the, the that industries have been so resistant to including different voices in their, in their storytelling? And, and so I was I was going to kind of open it up. I was just going to say to people who are who are here, by the way, do feel free to um, put any questions in the Q and A box if you have any questions for Melissa and Matthew. Uh, otherwise, I'll just drone on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but feel free to join in if you wish. But I was wondering if we could talk a little bit more about um, this idea of representation in um, 
in musical theatre, in ballet, in in the performing arts in general, and and thinking about how we encourage um, different voices to be able to be heard within it um, as well. I, d I don't know whether you have any thoughts on that, either of you at all. Well, yeah, I mean, just, um, I think, I mean, I've mentioned it just, just, uh, you know, it's very hard to um, believe that you can do something when you don't see, see people doing it. And something I've realized is that, um, you know, rather, than, I mean, not rather than waiting, I mean, there's, there's one way, if, if there's a urge inside you that wants to hear or see something, I would encourage anyone with that urge to be that, to, to be the change rather than wait for the change. Um, but obviously there's many logistical and systemic reasons why lots of voices don't get to be heard. Um, but something I think I've really very recently realized um, and learned is that it, it, you've got to, you you just got to do it. Like you, you have to be that voice that you want to hear. And um, often once you've, you've written it or you've created something it's yeah it, that's the that's the healing that you were looking for really um creating it yourself in a way Thanks. i don't know really if that answered your question at yeah. all <laughs> absolutely it does and um, melissa is, is there anything you can add to that yeah i i think a lot about sort of what my writing partner kit often says is that it's important to him you know to tell stories about himself and you know in a trans identity and also tell stories that he didn't really see a lot growing up and i think in a way he always says you know like trans folks already face so much adversity in their lives right and you know they are um they're they're high risk for violence for homelessness they can't you know uh they yes it's <laughs> it's really there's a lot and so he always says you know, if if you can't even look at yourself in the mirror and feel good about being alive and being, you know, being yourself, then how could you go up, out and like get a job and try to like, you know, to to find a home to do all these things. Right. And I think at the end of the day, I think part of why we're doing this is is because of people like Henry, like the character Henry in our in our show where, you know, they can come to a theater and see themselves represented um uh honestly on stage you know it might not be everybody's experience of course um but to be able to see a multitude of representations uh for themselves right so so i think for us it's it's important to to create a critical mass of of materials not just like interstate and then and then we're done we want to tell stories in which trans people can be uh complex and not great and also wonderful and also you know clumsy and <laughs> and graceful you know and so so um so really that's that's sort of our our mission and we're we're not just talking about trans folks also you know folks of color and and asian american folks because that's that's us and that's what we know how to write so um so yeah i think i don't know if that sort of answers your question or adds to what you were asking james but i think that really drives a lot of what we do and we, we find that work to be important yes yeah no absolutely that that makes that makes perfect sense i was wondering as well about um perhaps uh, artists that um that influenced you in in your work who who did you when you were starting out or uh, you know who do you, which pieces of work or which artists do you really look up to um this is a really interesting question for me because i am not like a theater person i'm not a theater nerd growing up i didn't i didn't go to the i mean it's so inaccessible too i think that's the other thing that we also are really aware of is that like at least theater in the united states i don't know how it is over there but in the units is so inaccessible it's not like you can just go and see a lot of theater if you don't have the means to um so so I didn't actually grow up with a whole lot of theater. I will say this sounds a little bit like a cliche because I'm a queer a queer singer songwriter, but I, I grew up listening to a lot of Ani DeFranco and I understand now as an adult, you know, there are certain things that I'm like, okay, I can see like I've developed my own voice, but I think listening a lot to her growing up made me think like, oh, like, words you know music can be activism like music can be activism uh words words can be activism it's really important um and so i think that really was the start of 
my own personal activism in my art um and it's it's sort of bled its way <clears throat> it's sort of bled its way into you know now it's a totally different art form but i think that still sticks with me that like art is activism and and that really drives a lot of what what we do thank you melissa what about you matthew um yeah as you asked that i was thinking who did i look up to growing up i think it was it was really hard um to find someone i resonated with growing up um yeah i mean you know honestly the first time i ever really saw so my first kind of like thing that i really fell in love with that i followed kind of religiously because i resonated with it was actually k-pop and i'm not even korean i'm i'm hong kong chinese and i'm from england and but the the thing that i loved was k-pop all the way over here in england and it was just seeing asian faces kind of singing dancing and then also k-drama and stuff and acting and you know subtitles were my life saver um i just really consumed a lot of kind of korean culture and i think it was just seeing kind of an asian face doing doing the things that i wanted to do was so inspiring for me and then moving on from my k-pop phase if i've ever moved on i still kind of love it um, <laughs> um i you know i really loved i love the work of like sandra O oh and a lot of asian americans um i think this might be a sweeping generalization, but I do feel like the conversation in terms of representation for Asian people is a lot further ahead in America. And there's a lot of creatives over there. So a lot of my people that I looked up to were overseas in America. Um, and then other than that, um, I love the work of Michaela Cole. I love um, Phoebe Waller-Bridge. Um, just yeah people who are amazing on screen and on stage and and just are unapologetically themselves i think is what i'm draw, drawn to yeah yeah i mean that's it's 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 so interesting hearing hearing this whenever you talk to anybody about about their influences because it's a uh, that i mean i i it's there's, there's so many different ways that you can be uh, influenced isn't there but it, i think this idea of seeing yourself is so important. I mean, it seems to be the, the theme that we we keep coming back to. Um, and I suppose I suppose what I'm thinking now is about the the experiences in an industry where perhaps you see yourself less, or um, I'm thinking ballet as well, particularly Matthew. But um, you know, places where um, there certainly aren't many creatives in power that are similar, and thinking about how you negotiate that and and how you how we uh, help this representation to move forward so that we keep telling multiple stories and, and uh, of people from multiple backgrounds all the time. I wondered if you had any advice on that at all. Do you want to go? <laughs> no, no, you should go. You should go. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I guess in, so the predominant, the, the, my the most part of my career so far has been in ballet and um actually interestingly ballet was a conscious choice from a young age i started out in musical theater um i played billy elliot on the west end at the age of 12 which was kind of um to me i didn't really understand at the time being so young um how kind of for lack of a better word, kind of groundbreaking that kind of was, because it was kind of, um, I remember when I got the role and kind of like newspapers and the press was really hammering on about being the first, I don't, yeah, the first non-Caucasian actor to play the role of Billy Elliot. And I think for B when I was a young child, I was like, to me, that whole concept hadn't, hadn't really crossed my mind in terms of being like the first one to kind of take on that role and what that meant um, and obviously I'm very very grateful for that opportunity because it really has opened many doors for me but it does you know kind of it goes to it just yeah it, it was it goes to show that it, it a lot of work needed to be done considering I was the first one so from musical theatre I kind of had this strange start where kind of unrealistic a kind of unrealistic start into the industry where I was playing the title role of a musical and um 
the yeah the lead role and actually for the rest in in the rest of the musical theater industry there was no other kind of no other kind of story being told at that time um that could also have an asian lead character so growing up i thought at the age of 12 i thought okay i'm going to have a future in musical theater but actually looking around there weren't actually any kind of roles to even aspire to so meanwhile that all the other kind of all the other billies um who are mostly caucasian um they kind of had a very clear trajectory of what they could build work towards i kind of had nothing really to aim aim for and thankfully for my mother um thankfully my mom who is an inc incredible woman you also know her james um, <laughs> she was like right my boy has you know this passion to perform what yes musical theater is what he he wants but you know realistically like my mum could see the, the the could see ahead the struggles that were going to be there for me um but then so she kind of like you know she, we had a talk about it and I, I think it must have been so hard i thinking back it must have been so hard for a mum to tell your to tell a son like yes i understand this is what you want to do but the reality of it is going to be very difficult. Um, and from those conversations, we kind of worked out, what else do I love to do? And it was ballet, specifically ballet. I really loved ballet. And, you know, I could always keep up my singing and acting. Um, but ballet was the most accessible kind of industry at that point, because um, looking at the ballet world, there were quite a few Asian dancers and although they might not have been from the UK, there's a lot of like international, well, from Japan, Korea, China, kind of international for the UK um, talent that was coming into the country. And therefore I had people to kind of look at and aspire to. And also from my mum's perspective, looking at it, this is a realistic viable kind of career, very Asian mum, but you know, very smart. This is a viable career for you because it's been done before clearly. So moving into that, yeah, that's, yeah. I'm kind of losing my train of thought, but. <laughs> I think the point is, is that once you can see yourself in there, it kind of opens up for people from the very, you know, early, very early ages to imagine themselves to be there. So I do think it is absolutely very important to have the voices and to have representation throughout in every kind of, every kind of level in the industry, whatever industry that you're going for, um, because you never know who's looking, you never know who's thinking, I might want to do that. And even just seeing an Asian dancer or an Asian, you know, choreographer or like rehearsal director uh, could be the reason why someone starts working in or pursuing that dream. Yeah, so thank you, Matthew, for, for that. Because it's uh, one of the things, I mean, as people who watch this regularly will know, uh, there are certain musicals that I have watched perhaps more than a couple of times. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And Billy Elliot um, was one of those for me, and that's actually when I I first well I first met your your mum uh, Matthew mm. through that, and then subsequently met you as well. And one of the things that has only recently um, occurred to me from talking to you, and also from talking to Leighton Williams, who was the first mixed race uh, act to play Billy, is how difficult it must have been within that setting with you being the only Asian person, or, or with Leighton being the only mixed race person in that whole setup, because it was done in a in a very sort of colorblind way in that your parents were both played by white actors but what mm. that meant is within that company there was just you and there was just Leighton and I and it only occurred to me very very recently how difficult um not necessarily difficult but how how many problems come out of that that situation and how now when we're, when we're talking about uh, Leighton playing every, Jamie and everybody's talking about Jamie that's something that they've addressed it's now not done in a way where the parents are white and the child is mixed race if one of the if the actor playing the son is mixed race then the parents are you know you have a mixture of parents a black parent and a white parent or whatever it might be mm -hmm. and that really so thank you for talking about that because I think it's only because I hear you talk about those things where I go oh, actually there's something that we need not to repeat in this industry um, <laughs> again um, but Melissa I don't yeah. know whether anything kind of has yeah. occurred to you through that I I will say I mean I think that's that's so inspiring and that's amazing I agree totally that like 
to give more opportunities for different types of folks to play these roles. I also think that it's important to have roles specifically written for folks like us, right? Like, like mm -hmm. I think that, I mean, as you were talking, I was also thinking a lot about like this role of Henry, right? That we'd created, that nobody said we could cast. Like when we were going through it, they're like, oh, what? Like a South Asian, like non-binary slash trans person who hadn't taken tea, so still has like kind of a high voice and is a good actor and singer you know and and dancer so it, it's uh it's it was hard and then we we always got like well you know could this person not be asian because we could find you a bunch of like white non-binary folks so it's like, like no 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 this person has to be asian it's like okay well maybe this person can just be like a cis asian <laughs> like no nope, this person can't be a cis asian so so what ended up happening was we went on this journey of being like okay well if people aren't going to help us we'll just do it and james you know because i just sent you i just sent you a casting note for it we're looking for a dash but um but yeah like so we we did this in 2018 we went out and we sent uh, I personally sent emails to every single musical theater and drama program in the country, in the U.S. and in the U.K. as well. And just was like, hey, is anyone fit in this role? We will fly them over. Like, instead of spending that money on a casting agent, a agent we said, well, we'll spend that money to fly them over um, and house them. And so um, so what ended up happening was there was just all these talented folks that were undiscovered that people didn't know who who auditioned and we ended up finding a true star Sushma Saha who you know you've seen um is just incredible and and I think as a result of that there's also been folks who have reached out and said oh you know I'm I'm exploring my gender I'm exploring this and I, I'm exploring being an actor and I d at first I was discouraged because there was no roles for me but I you know, I was able to download Loser Dumplings. I use that now. You know, I learned that I work on that with my vocal teacher or like now I have now I have a role to to aspire to do. Right. So I think that's also really important to have have those roles so people can continue to <laughs> there could be more trans actors and, and, you know, Asian American queer actors out in the world. So. So, yeah, I think that's part of it. Absolutely. I think one of the other things that always comes um, uh, comes out as well, whenever I speak to, I mean, uh, Matthew, I've met you maybe a couple of times in person and Melissa, we've spoken a few times as well. But the thing that I, I that always comes out of me is how much joy there is in the, the way, even though some of the experiences that you talk about and some of the experiences that you, um, uh, that you write about are, you know, it can be quite difficult experiences. I always, I always really look forward to talking to you both because uh, that is just such, and it's something I recognize perhaps in myself as well in terms of the LGBTQ identities, this kind of concept of joy and how different that is to the kind of roles that we've been pigeonholed into, uh, you know, over the years, you know, we, we must be very sad and depressed. We know we must make sure that we, you know, if we don't die at the end of our story, then we must need to make sure that somebody very important to us does, you know, all of these, these very, you know, <laughs> very difficult tropes. And actually when I think about your work and I think about, uh, your work Matthew both the work that you presented a couple of weeks ago but also your work as Merlin and uh I mean going right back to your the role of, of Billy Elliot but I saw you do Boy in the Stripe pajamas as well and through all of those things even though they are difficult roles that kind of feeling of the joy of seeing you on stage and and the joy of seeing you in person as well and likewise Melissa whenever I think of Interstate that is one of the most joyful musicals that I can think of and I'm so excited to hear more about Missteps as well because I know that that's uh, another musical which carries that on I was wondering maybe if you could talk a little bit about that kind of idea the the sort of where the joy comes from in I mean maybe you don't feel that there is joy but I certainly get joy from both of you so where that where that kind of comes from and how that's something that we might put into our work yeah I feel like there's not enough queer joy in our communities mm. um <laughs> yeah especially with me and Kit who we, we work primarily also with, with trans folks and trans characters it's like there's the life is already difficult enough I feel like we want to see that represented. I mean, even something like in Interstate, one of the things that we we won't, you know, if people have said, oh, you know, we really are attached to the to Henry storyline. He has an arc. Of course, he has joy. He experienced joy. He's very positive. But there's a lot of adversity that happens to him. I think a lot of folks are like, oh, this 
is so strong like what if we made it all about henry we're like we don't want to see that we've seen that before we've seen we've seen a young a young trans person struggle through life and have all these bad things happen to him well we what we really want to see is the juxtaposition between uh between someone who's a little bit older and who experiences queer joy a lot right and and what that looks like and what they're struggles are right so so i think uh it's really important for us and you mentioned misstep james it's a uh, uh, matthew you, you don't know this show but it's a it's a 80s dance aerobics musical featuring an all trans lead cast in in nice. their in their middle ages so it's so it's also it. it's like middle age trans queer joy is uh Amazing. and that that just doves tail with what we were talking about before about how like you know these folks don't see themselves on screen like i mean especially actors any actor over a certain age you're like i don't I, are there even any roles for me but beyond you know you know someone's mom or something so um so i think it's important to create these roles for our community our friends like so many friends are like oh i i want to create something that you could be in um and also feeling free in their bodies as queer trans folks right which which we don't we, we're not really tapped into that. Uh, and I mean, I as a cis person, more so than a trans person, but still like we're not tapped into that. We're not learned to love our bodies or feel free in our bodies. So we wrote a whole show in which just a bunch of queer trans people are dancing uh, <laughs> the entire time. Um, and and so that's really super important to me and, and our work. Absolutely. Is there any plans for um, sort of workshops for Misstep? I mean, I guess you're very busy with Interstate at the moment, but where, where does Misstep go next? Yeah, Misstep is actually having quite a bit of support, um, primarily from uh, the Village Theatre out in Seattle, as well as Playwrights Horizons in New York. So there's a lot of things brewing that's coming up. Um, uh, this, this, things are still solidifying, but definitely sure. workshop production coming up soon, um, if not this year, next year. Amazing. That's yeah. great. That's great to hear. Uh, Matthew, I was kind of going to turn back to this this sort of mm -hmm. idea of where we find joy from um, mm -hmm. in your work and in your life as well, I suppose, really. Yeah. Um, well, I think just thinking about um, queer joy and seeing happy gay people is like, it. I think until very recently, probably, yeah, it's, it was... So I remember growing up kind of trolling YouTube, crawl, trolling Netflix, any sort of show that had an LGBTQ theme to it, because I just needed to see something that I resonated with. And I think, yeah, I also realized that a lot of, there are a lot of tropes, I mean, importantly, so that, you know, we have historically, it's been very difficult. Um, but I realized that a lot of these stories were tragic, like you, like you said, and um, just very kind of, kind of um almost in some cases i think romanticizes the like the tragedy of what queer people go through um and i think from as for me um i think maybe coming from a very privileged place um having grown up in this era that we're in and not really coming across that much adversity for my in terms of my sexuality I kind of didn't, you know, I, I found it hard to relate to a lot of these stories and um, that's not to say I had it super easy, but at the same time I wanted, like you said, it's very important to see joy and I was wanting to see more kind of positive and happy and not, you know, romanticizing everything, but, you know, just a story where it doesn't, no one has to die at the end. Um, and I think like what I realized is that um, the work that I love to see is like um, people existing within, like with all the complexities of being who we are, may that be LGBTQ plus or a person of color, um, but also finding the joy in being all of those things. Um, and I definitely have people in my life that we are best friends, we're great friends because we we relate to each other in terms of being people of color or being gay and but at the same time you know when we're together we have the best time we have so much fun and also without it's just that knowing that we both we we would both know um and i i just love that um kind of relationship um the two-hander that i wrote in my piece existential was based on my best friend and our relationship is we both we're both gay and 
we both know how hard it is but at the same time we're just 28 20 year olds just trying to live life like we, we we're being messy as well as like you know we we know how difficult it is but that's not what we focus on all the time we're trying to live a good life as well and I think um yeah I think it is really important to show that it can be fun <laughs> That that moment where you just said there, that thing about we know, that was that's just that's I was a bit teary then because that I I don't think I've actually articulated it in that way before. That idea of I remember talking to some people about the reason why sometimes it's good to cast LGBTQ actors in LGBTQ roles. And they talked about this idea of a queer shorthand. And I I think I'd thought of that. And that, but that to me is that's a it's quite like a it's a bit of a sterile sterile concept, you know, like yes, yeah, we all know how that works, we all know how that works. And when you just said that now, it made me realize how you can meet somebody, you know, you know, and if if both of us are gay or both of us are, you know, have have had a, a Christian upbringing or both There's whatever a connection, yeah. Yeah, that connection, it's not even something you need to talk about in any great yeah. detail. It's just you go, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah i get it i get it yeah and that's all it is and it, that that moment to me is so is so amazing and actually perhaps explains mm -hmm. to me why at the moment i've got such a um a focus on lgbtq musicals and work and that kind of thing mm -hmm. because i think i'm used to going to the theater and have seen all these lovely stories with all the big sets and everything uh, but but it being very sort of all, the, all these all these very straight representations and I, I th when I see those stories or hear the, the story that you wrote Matthew or the musical that you wrote Melissa there's something so um even though there's I, I'm quite removed from it in some ways there's just that some of those moments where you go I yeah. know <laughs> I think it's also like like Melissa touched on as well just when you're writing or when you're creating you often have to think who your audience well you have to think who is my audience and I was very conscious to say like I want my audience like I very selfishly was like I'm writing for myself like my audience is people right. like me and I think that a lot of the time again another probably sweeping statement maybe a lot of the LGBTQ material that is out there on big streaming platforms is geared towards the target audience is straight cis hetero people mm -hmm. and for us as gay people, we obviously, queer people, we obviously, some we sometimes feel like it's all just kind of, it's being hammered over and over and over, spelled out over and over and over again. And um, I think I can always tell when there's a writer who is East Asian in a production or in a film or in a TV show. And if there's a writer that is LGBTQ+, plus, because it's just something in it that I'm like, wow, that, yeah, I resonate with that. and. Like you said, yeah, it's a shorthand. You don't, it doesn't need to be spelled out, but there's just something in there. And yeah, so I agree. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, I was thinking also, Matthew, I think when you were talking mm. about um, you wanting to, you when you were doing uh, Billy Elliot and, and how your, your mom was saying to you, you know, like had to sit you down and be like, well, this is, this is going to be hard. Yeah, yeah. I, I, th I thought about that too in terms of thinking about like queer joy and I mean I experience a lot of queer joy in my life like I'm mm -hmm. happy person I have a lot of joy in my life and so I want to put that on stage and I think in a way that makes me think of you know my my own mom who has been like you know this is difficult like I'm worried for me that like mm -hmm. being queer somehow like my my life's going to be really difficult and that and so in, in a way I feel like maybe there's a there's a, this, a positive effect also in terms of of that where you know the more you could show people hey actually we could be queer and actually really happy and really fulfilled and wonderful and and all of that i i yeah i often wonder sort of maybe on a personal level like that how that would affect so someone like my mom you mm -hmm. know who's who's always told me oh you know like when yeah. you when you grow up you should you shouldn't write these songs that have these messages maybe you should just write like some disney songs or something <laughs> yeah <laughs> What she doesn't know is I am writing Disney something for Disney, but it's queer. Awesome, amazing. <laughs> so. Yeah, it is. Get some queer coding into that Disney song. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, I feel like we're at the stage now. I just you know forget the coding. Just put some queer things into the. Just Disney. do it full on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and it, awesome. it, 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 yeah, it's. I mean, it's always so um, so lovely to talk to both of you. 
um about the about these sort of things and um, i just wanted to just putting just i'm aware for the people who are watching i just want to put something in the chat there's an event going on next monday and tuesday in london if anyone's in that area um it's a musical theater event uh, it's uh put on by benjamin armstrong uh, uh and his group representation uh and it's a whole evening of asian performers from musical theater uh who are uh, and it's put together it's the first time i'm going to on i'm going on tuesday if you want to join me but um it's uh it's a really fantastic um it looks like a really fantastic uh, evening and i just wanted to kind of draw people's attention to that and, and uh, so that's monday and tuesday this week uh, and and something that's happening a lot at the moment is people looking at asian representation particularly in musical theater and i th Think you're right matthew i think we were a long way behind in this country and it's you know really great to support uh to support that uh wherever we can so i've, I've popped that in the chat there uh, i just wanted to kind of close things just to see if there was anything else that um that people that you wanted to kind of draw out of today um that you think would be important for the people that are listening so we've got a mixture of students and uh, uh people from the industry audience members that side kind of thing is there anything that you would want to share with them to kind of finish this off i always think i always finish like this like, that's such a high pressure question why <laughs> <laughs> it's so open-ended i don't i don't yeah. really have anything i don't know matthew if you do uh, um <laughs> yeah i mean just without sounding you know obviously everyone do what you want to do um i just <laughs> um something that really helps me is finding my community so if you are you know if if you're looking for if you if you feel like you need to be with people or you need to see something you need to see yourself um find your people like i can't tell you how much my life changed when i you know growing uh, growing up in england Yes, um, I had Asian friends, but, you know, Asian creatives and LGBTQ creatives specifically, um, just, I didn't know where to find them, but I found my people. I, I you know, I, I, I looked for my community and build, yeah, build your community, I would say. Um, and you can really support each other, build each other up and be critics for each other. And yeah, find those people. Um, they, they are they are who get me through <laughs> um i think maybe uh well you know this this reminded me of something you said matthew about um oh my god now i now i've lost my train of thought but i i think i think what i meant to say is um is around writing for yourself and writing oh, yes that's what you said Matt, mm -hmm. about about mm -hmm. how you're doing you're writing what you want to see and i think sometimes just from a writer's perspective it's easy it's easy to worry about what people want to see, what other people want to see mm -hmm. um but i think the best thing you could do is write from your heart about your own experience about the things that you want to see and then just like what you said james is you're like you you know like even interstate is such a specific story right <laughs> that it's you know it, it's it's not necessarily about you james but you will go in and you'll experience it and you'll find those levels of universality and connection in the specific so so i think for me you know if there are writers out there who are constantly worried about what other people want to see i would say just write write what you want um and and i think it can't really go wrong absolutely I echo that yeah <laughs> Oh, thank you both so much. It's always such a pleasure to spend some time with you. Um, just a quick reminder about Interstate, if you happen to be around Los Angeles in June, which is at the uh, East West, um, East West, yeah. East West Players. That's right. Yes, that's right. And, and Matthew, please let us know of uh, anything else that you've got uh, coming up. Uh, and, I've got, and anyone who's here that's, uh, if you need help finding your community, please do feel free to get in touch with me anytime. One of the great things about writing a book is that I have spoken to lots and lots of people from lots and lots of backgrounds, and I'm always happy to try and put people in touch wherever I can. Um, so that's the last of our Represent series for LGBT History Month, even though we're only halfway through uh, <laughs> the month. But that, this, that's the last one of these panel events here. Uh, there are some other events which are going on, which you can find from the university website. But thank you again to Melissa and to Matthew. And thank you all for joining us. I hope you have a, a safe weekend. I hope if you're in the UK, the storm is starting to calm down now. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you all again very, very soon. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you, James. Thanks, Bye. Melissa. James. Bye.